and welcome to our podcast. I'm Dani, and today, Great.com talks with Dr. Lucy Camp, the project manager at the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. If you haven't heard of them, they work to first slow, then reverse the decline of the southern ground hornbill in South Africa. Before we begin, remember, if you're new here to this podcast, press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app. Hi, Dr. Lucy, and welcome. Hi, Danny. Cool to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I, we're looking forward to learn more about this. I did know, did not know about the ground hornbill, I gotta say. So let's begin with that. Tell us more about it. You know, it's, it's a bird, right? And where is their natural habitat and what's the level of threat they're facing right now? Okay, um, it is a bird. Um, some would say an ugly bird. I think a gorgeous bird. Uh, big black birds, they stand about a meter tall. They've got these beautiful white primary feathers when they take to the wing. Incredibly long eyelashes. Uh, so things that a supermodel would be absolutely jealous of. Um, I've had people describe them as aging show models, which I think is one of the, uh, sorry, aging show girls, which I think is one of the loveliest um, descriptions. So they occur in the savannas and grasslands on the African continent. There's two species. Um, the southern is the one that we work with. And that is found from the Eastern Cape in South Africa all the way to Southern Kenya. And then the other ground hornbill occurs north of the equator in the northern uh, savannas. That one is very understudied, and so we're starting to get some research up and running on that finally, but it's the one in the south that I spend most of my day job trying to tackle and trying to tackle the threats. That's incredible, and I gotta say, it's a huge bird. Oh my God. <laughs> it's huge, but it does, I think I loved your description of it. It, it shows like how much you care about them. <laughs> Now, talking about uh, the project, right? Uh, How did it all begin? How did the Ground Hornbill project begin and when exactly? So this project started in 1999. Um, so we've been running for decades now. And it started on a small reserve in South Africa called the Mabula Ground, sorry, the Mabula Private Game Reserve, which is where we are based and hence we're the Mabula Ground Hornbill project. And it started because an English woman came out uh, to retire into the African bush and she wanted to kind of explore her new country. And she ended up at one of the bird parks called Mgeni River Bird Park. And there she met one of the show birds, uh, a boy called Marilyn. And she completely fell in love with this bird. And she came back to the reserve and started asking questions. Why isn't this bird here? This habitat seems really good. And through that, she got in touch with my father. And my parents did all the early research on these birds from 1966 in Kruger National Park. So it's the worst paid family career known to mankind. But here we are. Um, and at that time, my father was looking for a release site to try. He'd been trying to figure out, can we take chicks that would naturally die in the wild and use them as a source for rebuilding populations? So he was at the very early days of trying to figure that out out um and so yeah i guess as they say match made in heaven and so what started as a, a single reintroduction site we now run across all four provinces in south africa where the bird occurs and now we're doing projects into namibia botswana zimbabwe and yeah just trying to share everything that we've learned over the last decade so everyone else can have a bit of a jump start on their conservation That's that's actually incredible. And I, I would say it's probably the most passionate family career <laughs> I've ever heard. It's not we should look at it through this perspective, actually. <laughs> well, Doctor, you you mentioned that you began in 1999, right? So this is here my curiosity kind of kicking in and trying to learn more about this because it's been a long road. No, it's been a while now. And One thing that I liked in, in your mission is that you state that to first slow and then reverse the decline. So from since then, since 1999, how has the project like progressed, you know, in this slow, slowing process? So I would like to think we would be faster if ground hornbills did things faster, but they live until they're about 70. They don't breed until they're about 10. 
And so it's taken us a long time to develop techniques that we know will work. Uh, we try and ensure that everything we do is science-based because I feel very strongly about the fact that the decisions we take for them today, we may only see the fruits of those decisions in 10 to 20 years' time because of their incredibly long life history. So the very first, I would say, 10 years was trying to figure out how to hand rear these chicks. they very difficult species. Often I wonder why I didn't pick something like a little finch or something that I could breed up thousands in a year, release them and call it a day. Uh, they just, they're socially complex. So they, the whole family group is an alpha pair and then the rest are boys that fight in the army and the girls get kicked out young. And, you know, these are all the things that we've learned slowly as we try and develop techniques for hand rearing, then reintroductions. Can we build artificial nests? How do we best go about communicating the threats of these in our education programs? Um, and I think for, I think it's changing now, finally, as conservation becomes a mainstream career. But I think, you know, when we started, there wasn't a textbook. We had to figure all the stuff out. And that's one of the things I feel very strongly about is not having anyone make the same mistakes. And, you know, hence our efforts to try and help all of our neighboring range states um, to, you know, we've got these tools, we've developed them. Let's help everyone just jump in, use them, train them. Uh, and try and speed up the conservation because, you know, I think we, we're going to lose them if we don't if we don't get this right. Wow. And I think it's actually a good strategy if you think about it, like as, as a ripple effect, right? If you teach more people on how to use the tools and how to do it and why it's so important, you actually have more hands on it. So it's a different approach. So this is mm. this is really good. And talking talking about the approach, you actually mentioned like your education programs briefly, but I would like to kind of move into that because you know uh you go you try to act from preservation to even reintroduction right and then you know research and education all of this so let's focus on this first bit of preservation and reintroduction what are the projects you know what are your way to actually tackle that um, so I, I, I prefer the word restoration than preservation. Um, it's, you know, we're trying to, so we take these second hatch chicks that would naturally die in the nest. So we harvest them. We make sure that the first chick is good and strong so that we're not impacting the wild population at all. And we have a specialized rearing center where these chicks go. We've got specialized rearers who know how to rear them, which I'm so grateful isn't my job. Um, and then from there, we use those birds to restock areas where the birds have already become locally extinct. It's a very slow and expensive process. And so we can't sort of breed up hundreds and chuck them out. They have to go through what we call a bush school phase because they really silly until they're five years old. And I'm using the word silly as a complete underestimate. Um, you know, they need all the support of the older experienced birds in a group to teach them how to kill venomous snakes, where to sleep, how to avoid leopards and caracals and things like that. So they have to go through this bush schooling process first before they're ready to go off on their own. So it's a very slow process. And so what we do is we use that to strategically plug holes in the population. So where we're seeing gene flow gaps, that's where we use the reintroductions. Um, I think initially we thought maybe this was something that we could, you know, just breed them out and chuck them out. Um, but they don't allow for that. So that's the, the system that we've had to do. Um, and so I think then the rest of the program is all to sort of fill the rest of the gaps. So that is where we try and do things where they've already become locally extinct. But then obviously we've got to protect what we've already got. So we've got to work through all the different threats and find ways to fix those. Uh, a lot of education and awareness, I think, because they do so well in protected areas, because there's none of the people threats. Anyone who goes to our big national park, Kruger National Park, will see 10, 10 birds easily on any trip and they come away thinking that ground hornbills are fine, but they're only fine within our big protected areas. And that's quite a small proportion of the whole population. Actually, our focus has to be outside of the protected areas. And so that's where we rely on everyday South Africans to be their custodians because they res they're territorial and resident in a territory. You know, we can't sort of herd them into a place. Um, you know, it's we have to kind of go family by family, territory by territory. And so that's where the custodianship part of the work is really important. Wow. Um, I'm picturing here, like, <laughs> it's a quite complicated process, honestly, you know, and, and it's really long term, like you're looking for a, yeah. a long term effect on it. So, wow. And 
what are the, what what other challenges do you face to keep you know the project running because you know we're, we're talking about something that you're gonna as i said gonna have a long-term effect you need to think in the long run but i i believe that this is just one bit of it what other challenges are you facing right now yeah so yeah i mean definitely the time thing um, I think that plays into funding a lot because many conservation grants are one year, two years, three years. Um, and it's very hard for us to show immediate results. What we're doing is, is you know, providing the framework for recovery. And so, you know, it's quite hard for us to show within a year what we've achieved because, you know, a ground hornbill itself does nothing in a year. You know, it might look at a girl that it fancies, but it might only talk to it next year kind of thing and maybe ask it out on a date the year after that. So, you know, they they themselves are slowing the process down. Um, and so what we do need is long-term support. Um and to be able to um to be able to retain staff in a long-term capacity. That's really important for us. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, I love the way you talk about the birds. You know, it really <laughs> like they're a part of your family. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing to hear. Uh, I'm just gonna make a quick pause here to tell our listeners and everyone watching us on YouTube to go to your page, which is ground-hornbill.org.za. Uh, we're gonna make sure to add the link in the description of this episode, but in there you can actually see this beautiful bird, get more information about it, check in more detail what the foundation is the project is doing and you can actually get in touch with them but this is a, a bit for the next question for a future question before going there i want to know lucy what are the next steps that you guys are planning for you know a near future not that far as the birds maybe but you know, <laughs> a near future so for us currently, it's trying to find sustainable funding. Um, we lost a lot of our team to corporate just because conservation salaries in South Africa are in no way match corporate. And so, you know, you spend years building up capacity and then they realize that, yeah, and unfortunately, it's not seen as a, a career career and paid subsequently. So my goal this year is really to try and set up a sustainable funding mechanism um, to retain our team because we've got an amazing team. They work so hard. They're so dedicated. Um, but obviously, I want them to keep doing that, but also need to, you know, make sure that they can look after their own families and things like that. So, so in terms of, in terms of, my team that's my priority in terms of the birds i think this year is going to be a lot about consolidating a lot about the data we're sitting on a lot of really good science so getting that published and getting that out there um, again part of that sharing network that we do um, and then starting to really uh, focus in on these neighboring range states and give them much more support than we've been able to um, so really be on the ground to support looking potentially to support kenya and malawi those would be my next uh, sites of choice um these are other places where the projects i'm sorry where the birds are under threat uh, and then trying to get a lot more work up and going on the northern ground hornbill I mean, it's crazy that a bird this big is so understudied. There's a lot of really beautiful cultural research because these birds have such a strong cultural association. But in terms of actual biology and what they need from a conservation management point of view is practically unknown. And, you know, I fear we're going to lose them in our lifetime if we don't get cracking on that. So I think that's my next biggest challenge to tackle. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm i thinking here, it's kind of crazy in my mind to think that a bird that is has such cultural importance it's not being like studied in other levels because you know how we're gonna <laughs> take care of this cultural heritage of yours without exactly. yeah. really preserving it and one other thing that i want to ask here uh it's because you mentioned research and and i would like to know do you guys kind of pa make partnerships or collaborations with other organizations that came to my mind when you were mentioning like the preserved areas so I would assume that some collaboration goes in this level, but are there other collaborations going on right now? 
uh, massive collaborations. This is not a one organization job. They're a, a difficult species. They're widespread. Uh, so we work with a lot of academic institutions and the Fitzpatrick Hotbird Project is one of them with the APNR Ground Hornbill Project doing a lot of the research, particularly around climate change. These birds are, we're starting to see the impact of a warming climate on them. So there's a lot of research into that and a number of other academic institutions helping us. All of our national parks, uh, provincial parks, huge amount of support from them. A uh, lot of collaboration with our ex situ uh, conservation organizations, our zoos and bird parks, uh, you know, media collaborations yeah it just you know it's not it's 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 too big for for us to tackle on our own and you know i think with a bird like this we need to work in a very multidisciplinary way so you know social scientists are super important because so much of the bird stuff is actually about people and not about the bird at all you know people love this bird they have really strong connections with them so how do we use the cultural protection that's already inherent and turn that into a conservation opportunity so yeah it's 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 multidisciplinary uh, and it's going to take a village i guess <laughs> to pull this bird through <laughs> well absolutely and i think it's such beautiful and massive massive work that you guys are doing so thank you for doing this and congratulations actually for you know keeping it moving forward and thinking about this, I would like to know for our listeners that would like to get involved, you know, for anyone that got interested in supporting or getting involved with the project, really, what are the best ways to do it? Obviously, funding. I'm not going to be shy about that. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got to keep the teams out in the field. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, it's a long term commitment, this. Uh, but also, if people have skills, you know, if you're a graphic designer and you want to help us design education materials or a documentary maker and, you know, help us make little short dockies in different languages that we can use for our education program. So, you know, there's there's lots of different ways. You know, I would say check out our website, get in touch, um, and we see how we can partner with you. That's amazing. And thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Lucy. I learned a bunch and this was a great conversation, <laughs> truly. Awesome. Thanks so much. And for everyone listening, also thank you for staying with us for one more episode. And remember, if you enjoyed it, press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app because that shows the algorithms that this is an important conversation and more people can learn about the importance of the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. Check their page, help out if you can, and I see you in the next episode. Bye.